Hello. Welcome to this ARM Architecture Fundamentals video. We've designed this for ARM's Worldwide University program. My name is Chris Shaw. I'm ARM's training manager based at Cambridge in the UK. In this video, I hope to introduce you to the fundamentals of the most popular embedded processing architecture in the world today. That's the ARM architecture. In subsequent videos, we'll hope to look at more detail relating to system design, the range of cores available, and an introduction to writing software for ARM. But I need to start by warning you that this video isn't a detailed training on all aspects of ARM technology. I certainly don't have the time to tell you everything, not even everything you need to know. But what I hope to do is give you a gateway into the world of ARM that will enable you to navigate through other more detailed material, some from ARM, some from other places, with ease and confidence. So come with me into the world of ARM. There's an awful lot in here. We're going to start with a short introduction to ARM Limited. Now by that I mean the company, not the architecture. And ARM's story goes back a surprisingly long way, further than most people realise. First of all, a bit of history just to set the scene. ARM was founded in late 1990 as a spin-off from another Cambridge company. Acorn Computers, which no longer exists, made its name supplying desktop computers to the educational market in the UK. In the mid-1980s, uh, a small team within Acorn was charged with choosing a suitable processor for their next generation of machine. They drew up a spec and searched the market but after a while decided they couldn't find a product to fit. So a small team within Acorn took just 18 months to design and implement their own processor. And the first prototype ran code at Acorn's machine, Acorn's offices in Cambridge at April 26, 1985. Back then, it was called the Acorn Risk Machine. Acorn's fortunes took a turn for the worse and the processor design was spun out into a new company. And that was first called Advanced Risk Machines. The company and the processor are now known simply as ARM. Engineering development is concentrated at our headquarters office in Cambridge, England, with design centers in Sofia Antipolis in the south of France, Austin, Texas, and San Jose, California, as well as Trondheim, Norway, and Bangalore in India. ARM is best known for its range of risk processor cores, but also produces a large range of supporting technology, both for chip designers and software developers. That includes fabric and physical IP, software models and development tools, graphics, cores and peripherals. Now it's worth mentioning at this point, in case you didn't know already, that ARM doesn't manufacture silicon. ARM was a pioneer in the process of semiconductor intellectual property and the huge range of ARM powered devices which are now available are all produced by ARM's worldwide network of IP licensees. We prefer to call them partners as that better reflects the mutually beneficial relationship we enjoy with our partner community. You can find lots more information about ARM, the partnership and our history on our website. Do go and take a look. Starting with just 12 employees in Cambridge, ARM is now a truly global company. We employ approximately 2,700 staff across the world in a total of 29 offices in 15 countries. This slide helps explain where ARM products play through a generic digital product. Now, ARM supplies system level IP into the chip, along with physical IP to make sure it's manufacturable, development tools to help design and build the system architecture and software. There are of course a lot of other inputs and activities necessary to produce a finished product. Industrial design, packaging, casework, operating systems, peripheral IP and so on. ARM doesn't necessarily feature in all of those, but ARM has a lot of friends. ARM lies at the center of a global network, which we call the connected community. Any company that's associated with us and with our technology can become a member of this worldwide community, enabling them to share knowledge, experience, capability and expertise. 
And the result is an ecosystem of more than a thousand companies, unrivaled in the semiconductor industry. You can explore the membership of the connected community on our website, and there you'll find not only ARMS licensees and direct customers, but many other companies providing support services, design consulting and tools, as well as standards bodies and industry consortia. We're proud to work with all our partners and the connected community represents a huge resource pool of expertise and products for anyone looking to design an ARM powered solution. Here you can see just some of the huge range of applications in which ARM based solutions are deployed. There's everything here from hard disk drives to printers, from gaming devices to smart meters, washing machines and televisions. The list is really endless and it's growing all the time. So it shouldn't be surprising to learn that ARM powered products ship in huge volumes. To date, a total of over 30 billion cores have shipped and the number's growing at a rate of about 8 billion a year. And the total is predicted to exceed 100 billion by 2020. We're now going to look at ARM's current range of processor cores. And as you'll see, one of the reasons why ARM cores are so popular is we support a range of performance and capability points that is quite simply unequaled by any other architecture in the world today. I'm sure many of you will first have learned of ARM through the success of the ARM 7 TDMI processor core. That was widely adopted by the cell phone industry from the mid-90s onwards and was the foundation for ARM's early success. It's still widely available and you can buy a huge number of products that incorporate it, but ARM no longer licenses the 7 TDMI. But from it grew a large roadmap of products aimed at the real-time embedded space. Today, there are two main families, which are shown on the right. The Cortex-M family is intended for use in microcontrollers, where cost is at a premium. And at the upper end is the Cortex-R family. Now these provide very high performance and throughput, but with very precise timing properties and predictable interrupt latency. That makes it an ideal core for deeply embedded timing critical applications such as engine management systems and hard disk drive controllers. And now we turn to the range of application processors. The, the classic line of processors originated with the ARM 926 EJS and grew up to the ARM 11 MP. The roadmap now consists of the Cortex A family. These processors are aimed at scalable high performance in applications that require a platform operating system. That would be Linux, for instance. They, require, they incorporate sophisticated memory management capability and extended instruction sets for multimedia processing. Now, since the ARM 11 MP, we've included explicit support for multi-core systems, and the latest cores in Cortex-A are all available in multi-core configurations. That allows them to open a truly huge range of power and performance points. Now, in combination, they can be implemented in big little configurations. And that gives you an unparalleled ability to balance performance and power consumption in real time. Now you know a little bit about the origins of ARM and the architecture, it's time to take you inside an ARM-based device. Now, a typical ARM-based system on chip, or SOC, contains many components, only some of which are directly sourced from ARM. First of all, the core itself. That will generally be deeply embedded within the device and usually not directly visible at the device boundary. The debug port is often the only exposed connection directly to the core itself. There'll be some glue logic, like clocks and reset circuits, and since the ARM core only has two interrupt inputs, the most common peripheral will be some kind of interrupt controller. Within the device, the components are connected together using an on-chip interconnect bus architecture. For the vast majority of ARM-based systems, that will be the standard AMBA interconnect. And as you can see, AMBA specifies two buses. There's a high-performance system bus called AXI and a low-power peripheral bus called APB. And generally, APB is used to collect all the peripherals. AXI for memories and other high-speed devices. 
Most devices will have some amount of on-chip memory, as well as interfaces to external memory devices. Note, though, that the external interfaces around the boundary of the device will not be the AMBER bus. That's used internally and is not exposed. So far, we've looked at a range of processors which spans the tiniest microcontroller to the most powerful application processor. Surely one architecture can't provide all that capability. Well, yes and no. Over time, the architecture has developed a long way in capability. Recently, we've developed what we call architecture profiles. And they allow a single common architecture to support that huge diversity in performance and application. And over the next section, we'll take a look at the evolution of the architecture, and you'll see how we do this. As we've seen, the architecture itself dates back to about 1985. But it hasn't stayed static. On the contrary, it's changed hugely and it's evolved a long way from those early ARM cores, adding features and capability at each stage. Generally today, we don't talk about architectures earlier than ARM v4 t And that dates from the mid-1990s and was the architecture of the ARM 7 TDMI, the most popular early processor. Over the years since then, the architecture has been updated and expanded several times. Architecture 5TE was supported by the ARM NEN and ARM 10 families. Architecture version 6 by the ARM 11. And finally, we come to architecture version 7. And you can see that at each stage, we've added new features and improved functionality. But we've maintained backwards compatibility with earlier architectures. And it's this continuous upgrade path that has been one of the key drivers of the adoption of the architecture. But with the advent of version 7, there's a crucial change. Up to that point, all cores conformed to essentially the same architecture or feature set. And it became apparent that one architecture couldn't provide everything from the tiniest microcontroller to the smartest of smartphones. So with architecture version 7, we introduced what we call architecture profiles. And profile V7A provides features that support a platform operating system such as Linux, and these are designed for application processors. ARM v7R is designed at high performance predictable real time, and ARM v7M is aimed at cost sensitive microcontroller applications. It's important to grasp at this stage the difference between architecture version and the implementation of a particular processor that supports that architecture, and the two are quite different. The architecture defines how a processor behaves. It defines its programmer's model, its register set, instruction set, exception model, and so on. The implementation behind that can be significantly different. For instance, Cortex-A8 and Cortex-A9 are two processors that both support architecture profile ARM v7A. That means they're binary compatible. But internally, they're very different beasts. The ARM Cortex-A8 has a 13-stage pipeline, while Cortex-A9 has an 8-stage pipeline. So they process instructions internally in quite different ways. But the key point is that those instructions are the same in both cases. Because they support the same architecture, they're binary compatible. You might think that this slide looks like a lot of information. Well, to be honest, you'd be right. What it shows is which version of the architecture is supported by which range of ARM processor cores, going all the way back to ARM 7 TDMI. And when starting out with a new ARM-based device, information like this helps you track down which architecture it supports. And from that, you can determine which instruction set it has and what feature set it supports. Conversely, when you're looking to specify a new processor core for a new product, knowing what features you need leads you to a particular architecture. And from that, you can easily see which available processor cores support those features. But for now, the ARM v7 architecture is where it's at. So let's unpack those profiles a little further. Starting from the top, ARM v7A is the highest capability and highest performance profile. 
And devices supporting ARM v7A incorporate memory management units that allow implementation of a full virtual memory system as required by operating systems such as Linux. They also support trust zone security extensions for secure platforms like payment and digital rights management. And later ARM v7A devices also support some recent extensions. They include 40-bit physical addressing and also hardware virtualization. Not all devices support those latest features and they're currently only supported by the Cortex-A15 and Cortex-A7. Cortex-A devices are typically found in the highest performance applications such as smartphones, tablets, netbooks and digital televisions. Examples are cores like the Cortex-A9 and the Cortex-A15. And next we come to the ARM v7R profile. It's sometimes referred to as the hidden architecture because it's typically used in very deeply embedded applications. And this profile incorporates extensions which make it particularly good at hard real time, where very, very deterministic behavior is required. So for that reason, they don't support virtual memory. They typically support dedicated interfaces for high-speed on-chip memory and extensions like low interrupt latency that make response to real-time events much more deterministic and predictable. Typical applications for Cortex-R cores are engine management systems and hard disk drive controllers. This profile is currently supported by cores like the Cortex-R4 and Cortex-R5. And finally, we come to the ARM v7M profile. This is quite different in many respects to the other two, and it's targeted very specifically at microcontroller applications. The instruction set and the programmer's model are tailored to allow very low gate count implementations, leading to very low cost devices with very low power consumption. Among other changes are a different exception handling model, which is much closer to that found on traditional microcontrollers, and a fixed memory map, which makes for much more standardization across available devices and product lines. This is currently supported by devices like the Cortex-M0 and Cortex-M3. And the most recent addition is the Cortex-M0 Plus. That's the smallest core that ARM have ever produced. Now we've seen the product range and the evolution of the architecture, it's time to look at how these cores actually work at the programmer's model. Now, bear in mind as we go through that while the ARM v7A and ARM v7R profiles are quite similar, the ARM v7M microcontroller profile is quite different in significant ways. We'll point out some of those differences as we go through. Fundamentally, ARM is a risk architecture. Now, you might argue, and you wouldn't be the first, that most modern ARM cores are not really in the risk mold. But they have a strong risk heritage, and they retain many of those risk features, such as a load store instruction set, um, a largely orthogonal register set, and most instructions execute in a single cycle. Being a load store architecture means that the only instructions that can deal directly with memory are load and store instructions. If you need to process a value in memory, you need to load it into the core, process it, and then store it out again. You can't do that in a single operation with a single instruction. And while other common architectures are capable of manipulating or modifying the contents of memory directly, the ARM instruction set can't do that. Among other things, that makes for a much cleaner and more power efficient pipeline design. All internal registers, with the exception of some registers which are supported by vector processing features like NEON, are 32 bits wide. And they're processed by a 32-bit ALU. And memory is generally manipulated in 32-bit units. And this is ARM's word size. And it's fixed. We also talk about half words, which are 16 bits, and bytes, which are 8 bits. Now, when it comes to instruction sets, you'll find more than one on ARM cores. All V7A and V7R cores support the 32-bit native ARM instruction set, as well as what we call the thumb instruction set, in which instructions are either 32-bit or 16-bit. Now, the ARM instruction set unlocks the full performance potential of the core. While 
The thumb instruction set provides greater code density from compiled code, and switching between arm and thumb instructions is a process that we call interworking. Now normally, the compiler and the linker will handle that for you, and you don't have to worry about it. Some older cores support an earlier version of the thumb instruction set, where all instructions are 16 bits. Now, although we'll deal with them properly later, it's worth pointing out that at this point that the ARM V7M microcontroller cores only support the thumb instruction set. If you've worked extensively with modern processor architectures, almost any architecture, you'll be familiar with the concept of operating mode, and also with the idea of privilege. Many processors support, say, two modes, and they'll be called something like user and supervisor. And one of them will be privileged, supervisor mode, and the other will not be. And running in an unprivileged mode means there are certain things that you just can't do. For instance, disabling interrupts or reconfiguring memory access. Running in a privileged mode is typically the way operating systems work, and they use unprivileged mode for user tasks. And this allows the system to protect itself from user tasks and also protect those tasks from each other. Now, ARM cores have typically seven basic operating modes. Each has access to its own stack space and its own private subset of registers. And all except one are privileged. Now, here they are. The table shows you that six of the modes are privileged and just one user mode is unprivileged. So user mode is the one used by operating systems for user tasks and processes. You can also see that five of the modes are termed the exception modes, and each one is associated with handling a particular kind of exception or interrupt. For instance, IRQ mode is used for handling IRQ interrupts. SVC mode is used for handling SVC instructions and hardware resets. Now, each of these modes has its own stack space, and also a small set of private registers. And this feature, we call it register banking, makes the handling of nested exceptions much more efficient from a software point of view, provided those exceptions are of different types. Nesting exceptions of the same type is a little bit more complex, and we don't have time to treat that here. Just note that this is one of the slides that really only applies to Cortex-A and Cortex-R. The mode structure for Cortex-M is really completely different. The ARM v7 microcontroller profile defines just two modes, thread mode and handler mode. Now, thread mode is unprivileged, and we use that for application code. Handler mode is privileged and is used for exception handlers. And when the system resets, it starts execution in thread mode, and it automatically changes to handler mode on an exception, and then returns to thread mode when the handler completes. There are several options here for the programmer. It's possible, for instance, to configure the system so that both modes are privileged. And also, by default, they operate on separate stacks. But you can configure the system so they only use one stack. And these options allow software architects to define complex systems that make use of privilege, or very simple, straightforward systems which don't need it. And we'll say more about exceptions later. So let's have a look at how modes and registers interact. Here's the register set for user mode. And you can see it consists of R0 to R15, combined with a single status register, CPSR, that holds things like the current mode, ALU status flags, and so on. We'll look at that more in a minute. The other registers are currently not accessible and associated with other modes. But here they are. And you can see there's quite a lot of them but they're currently what we call banked out, and they're not in use, and they're not generally accessible. They come into use when the processor changes mode. So let's see what happens when we switch into IRQ mode. And here you can see that a subset of the registers change places, and some of the IRQ registers come into the usable set, while the corresponding user registers become banked out. Notice that Two of the registers that come into use are the link register, that's R14, and the stack pointer, that's R13. That means that IRQ mode, in common with all the other modes, has its own location for storing a return address, 
and also has its own private stack. Also at the bottom, you can see another new register, SPSR, or the Saved Program Status Register. And that's used for holding a snapshot of the current system state at the moment the exception is taken. And that makes returning to where we were very easy. We just have to switch the registers back, restore CPSR, and restore the program counter from the values that we saved. If we look at FIQ mode instead, you can see there's a much larger set of registers that switch places. R8 to R12 are additional private registers for, I, for FIQ mode. That's one of the things that makes handling FIQ mode a little more efficient and a little faster than handling the standard IRQ. On this slide, we don't mention system mode. You can see it's not there. That's because system mode uses the same registers as user mode. The only difference between the two is it's privileged. This slide summarizes the register organization in one easy to understand diagram. And there's one additional piece of information hidden here showing the partition of the registers. You see, when operating in thumb state, thumb instructions are only 16 bits in size. And that means that most of them don't include fields large enough to address all 16 registers. And they can only directly address the lower eight registers. So we refer to those as the thumb state low registers. R9 to R15 are the thumb state high registers. And there's only one or two instructions in thumb state that can access those. Note, the register set and organization that we've just seen applies only to the Cortex-A and Cortex-R cores. Cortex-M cores have a quite different register set and they're organized in quite a different way. I've said several times now that the Cortex-M register set is organized slightly differently. Well, here's how. You can see that there are only 18 registers. Um, it looks a lot simpler. The banking scheme we've seen for the other cores doesn't really apply here at all. First of all, there are 13 general purpose registers. R0 to R7 are the low registers, and R8 to R12 are the high registers. Then there are three special purpose registers, the stack pointer, SP, the link register, LR, and the program counter. And finally, one program status register called XPSR. It has a few other names too, which we don't need to worry about here. Now remember that Cortex-M cores have just the two processor modes, thread mode and handler mode. And just one register is banked between those modes, the stack pointer. So as well as the process stack pointer, we have a handler stack pointer, which is only accessible in handler mode. And unless running an operating system where you need to separate kernel level and thread level data and programs, the handler stack pointer is probably not needed. But either way, only one of the stack pointers is visible at a time, depending on your current processor mode. Here we have a little bit more detail about the status registers for Cortex-A and Cortex-R. The format of CPSR and SPSR is the same, and it's broken down in the diagram. Let's have a look at a few of those bits in more detail. At the left-hand end, bits 28 to 31 are the ALU condition codes. They're optionally set by data processing instructions and tested by conditional instructions. There are four additional GE bits, which are used to record multiple results from SIMD instructions. And those ALU status bits are the only ones you can modify when operating in user mode. The bottom five bits encode the current processor mode. And these are set automatically when a mode change occurs in response to an exception. And you can also modify them manually in a privileged mode so that you can change mode under program control. Two bits, the J bit and T bit, record the current state of the processor. And this tells us which instruction set the core is currently executing. It could be arm state, executing arm instructions, or thumb state, executing thumb instructions, or what we call Giselle state, where many of the cores can execute Java bytecode. These bits are never modified directly, and we'll look at how to change those when we cover the business of interworking. The I and F bits, they enable and disable IRQ and FIQ interrupts. There's an A bit, which allows asynchronous data reports to be temporarily suppressed, and an E bit, 
that allows the endianness of the data interface to be changed dynamically under software control, making it very easy to deal with mixed endian data. Now the remaining bits, well, they're reserved or they're used for internal system state and you should never modify those in your program. Now let me show you the status register for Cortex-M cores and you'll notice this is much simpler than previous status registers and that illustrates the fundamental simplicity of the Cortex-M architectures. You'll recognise the ALU status bits from the previous version. There is a T-bit but since most Cortex-M cores only support the thumb instruction set that bit is always set to 1 and you should never attempt to change it. And finally there's a field that contains the currently active exception number and that's when the core is executing an exception handler. OK, so we keep talking about exceptions. Well, now's the time to look at what actually happens when an exception occurs. Now, in the ARM architecture, an exception is just some kind of event which causes an interruption in normal program flow while the system deals with whatever caused that exception. Now, exceptions might be internal, such as a memory translation fault, or external, like an interrupt from a peripheral. They might be synchronous, like an SVC instruction, or asynchronous, like a timer interrupt. Now whatever their origin or cause, all exceptions are handled by the core in essentially the same way. So here's what happens. Here's our application, executing instructions one after the other. And here's an exception. Now the first thing the core has to do is make sure it can get back to this point after it handles the exception. So to do that, we have to take a snapshot of the current state. So the core copies CPSR and saves it in SPSR. And it copies PC and saves it in the link register. And then to prepare for the exception, the core switches to the appropriate exception mode, disables further interrupts, makes sure it's in the right state, and then uses the vector table to work out where to find the exception handler. And here's our vector table. It has a single entry for each exception type. And each entry is an instruction that branches to the relevant handler code. So all the core has to do is load the program counter from the right vector table entry. And then it executes the exception handler. And once the handler is completed, returning to the interrupted program is just a matter of restoring CPSR from the copy we saved in SPSR and restoring the program counter from the link register. And yes, as usual, I need to warn you that the exception handling model for Cortex-M microcontrollers is completely different. Here we're going to cover two extensions to the architecture. First of all, the security extensions. These go under the name of Trust Zone, and it's an optional extension to the ARM v7a profile. We support it on all of our current Cortex-A cores. A Trust Zone allows the implementation of secure platforms for things like digital rights management and secure payment solutions. What it does is implement two virtual machines running on the same piece of hardware. One, the normal world, and the other, the secure world. And through a set of secure attributes that are propagated right through the system and out onto the bus, the system designer can create secure peripherals and secure memory regions which are only accessible from the secure world. Transition between the two is handled by a secure monitor program. And access to that secure monitor program can be very carefully controlled and it takes great care to ensure that there's no leakage of data across the boundary between secure and normal. One more extension uh, added to the V7A architecture more recently and supported in the latest cores provides support for a hardware virtualization solution. An additional mode called Hype Mode allows implementation of a hardware virtualization hypervisor. And you can see that the hypervisor sits above the hardware and underneath guest operating systems. And you can configure things like exceptions and other system events to be trapped by the hypervisor and then signaled on to those guest operating systems. The diagram shows you that the hypervisor only exists within the normal world. And that allows system architects to combine the hardware virtualization solution offered by the hypervisor mode to the trust zone solutions and their secure platforms. So, 
we know all about registers and modes and stacks. So now it's time to look at the instruction sets supported by ARM cores. Now note first of all that I said instruction sets plural. That's because most ARM cores on the market today support more than one instruction set. First of all, there's the native 32-bit ARM instruction set, and then there's the thumb mixed length 16-32-bit instruction set. We'll first of all look at the ARM instruction set. Now, this isn't a class on ARM assembly language, so you won't see all the details here, but we'll give you a general introduction so that you know how the syntax works and you know how most of the instructions function. All of the instructions in the ARM instruction set are 32 bits long. Also, most instructions can be conditionally executed. That's a unique feature of the ARM architecture, and it means that each instruction has a condition field which suppresses its execution if that field doesn't match the current values of the ALU status flags in CPSR. This very flexible mechanism makes for very compact and power efficient coding. These days, there are a few unconditional instructions in there, but the majority of instructions can be made conditional. And as we've noted earlier, ARM architecture is a load store architecture, and the instruction set means that you can't directly manipulate the contents of memory. At first sight, the syntax of ARM instructions can look quite complicated, but once you've understand the basic structure of the operator and operands, it's really quite simple. This is a RISC architecture after all. So let's look at a few examples. And the first one, well, well, that really is simple. It's clearly a subtract instruction. It has three arguments. And the first is a register, and that's the destination for the result of the subtraction. The remaining two specify the input arguments. And you can just read this from left to right. R0 is R1 minus 5. This one is an add instruction and it illustrates the ability to provide a register as the second input operand, but also to be able to specify an inline shift or rotate that's applied to the operand as part of the instruction. This instruction reads as R2 equals R3 plus R3 shifted left two places. If you think about it, that equates to multiplying R3 by 5. So we can do some quite interesting and useful multiplications with this shift capability. This one is a logical AND instruction. Note that the AND mnemonic has a suffix S. Now this means that the ALU condition codes in the CPSR will be changed to reflect the result of this operation. Now ARM data processing instructions don't change the condition codes by default. This is an unusual feature of the ARM architecture. We have to use that S suffix to control whether the condition codes are changed or not. Now here's another add instruction, and this one is conditional. You can see it says add EQ. This means it will only be executed if the EQ condition is true when this instruction reaches the execute stage of the pipeline. It reads simply R5 is R5 plus R6, but if the EQ condition isn't true, it will behave simply as a no-op. Now here's a branch instruction. ARM branches, like this one, are PC relative. They have a range of plus or minus 32 megabytes, and the uh, offset from the current program counter is simply encoded in the instruction. Here's a load instruction. This simply loads into R0 from the word in memory addressed by the contents of R1. When we need to specify addresses in load and store instructions, we use square brackets to do that. Um, if there's more than one thing in the square brackets, then we just combine those. So here's a store instruction, and you can see the address it accesses is R3 plus R4. It's storing from R2, but there's some extra information here. STR, it means it's a store instruction. NE makes it conditional on the NE condition and the B indicates that it's a byte-sized store. So it just stores the least significant byte of R2 to the address R3 plus R4, but only if the NE condition is true. So far, we've only talked about the ARM instruction set. All ARM instructions, as we've seen, are 32 bits. 
To provide much better code density, some time ago ARM introduced a second instruction set coding called Thumb. And in this instruction set, all instructions are 16 bits. Thumb code typically provides about a 35% improvement in code density at the expense of some raw performance. All of today's Cortex cores support an extension to that called Thumb 2 technology. And this extends Thumb to provide a mixed length instruction set. Thumb 2 provides ARM performance with thumb code density, and the majority of C and C++ code is compiled for thumb on thumb2 capable cores. So, if thumb is so good, why do we focus so much on the ARM instruction set? Well, that's because thumb is the best target for compiled code. If you're writing directly in assembler, ARM is very often a better choice. And although some thumb has some more constraints that you might have to deal with, the syntax is very similar. Some ARM devices support other instruction sets too. VFP, or Vector Floating Point, is a standard floating point instruction set supported by most of the high-end cores. It needs a coprocessor to run at full speed, and there's widespread library support for it. NEON is a wide SIMD data processing instruction set which is supported by the optional NEON engine on many Cortex-A cores. The NEON engine includes its own set of vector registers and they're separate from the core registers. If your core does support NEON, you can take advantage of it in a variety of ways. Libraries, compiler intrinsics, or by writing directly in assembly language. And the ARM C compiler is also capable of automatically vectorizing code in order to make best use of the NEON instructions. Well, I'm afraid that's it as far as this introduction to the ARM architecture is concerned. Congratulations on sticking with me. We've covered quite a lot of ground so far. As I said at the beginning, this isn't an exhaustive overview of ARM and all the ARM technologies and all the ARM architectures, but it's just a gateway into the world of ARM. There's a wealth of documentation waiting for you on ARM's website. So go and take a look, infocenter.arm.com. Look out for things like architecture reference manuals, knowledge articles, FAQs, processor documentation, and developer guides. ARM also has a growing worldwide university program, which offers you a large set of teaching and training resources, then software tools, that's Kyle MDK for microcontrollers and DS5, typically for Cortex-A and Cortex-R. And hardware development boards, available from ARM and its large ecosystem of partners. The ARM University programme can also help you migrate your current teaching to ARM technology in a variety of fields. Obviously embedded systems and microprocessors and microcontrollers, but also SOC design and computer architecture, and even fields like robotics and mechatronics. With our partners, we're heavily investing in a lab-in-a-box package, and that supplies qualified professors with complete solutions, ready to deploy out of the box. The lab-in-a-box package contains hardware, software licenses, complete teaching resources, lecture notes, exercises, solutions, lab manuals, and more. We're also involved with enabling individual research projects open workshops and design contests. Contact us at www.arm.com university if you want to find out more. As an ARM student, one thing you might want to do is benchmark your knowledge. And the ARM Accredited Engineer program is the great way to do that. It's the only exam program supported directly by ARM. And through a simple computer-based testing scheme, it's available worldwide and there's a pipeline of further qualifications coming along in the scheme. More information at arm.com slash AAE. Well, that brings us to the end of this video introduction to ARM. I, I do hope you found it useful as a gateway to broaden your knowledge of the most popular architecture in the world today. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to hearing from you and watching your progress. Goodbye.